Good afternoon and uh, welcome to today's briefing where I am joined by Angela McLean, the Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor. I want to begin by updating you on the latest data relating to the coronavirus outbreak. 2,772,552 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the UK, including 89,784 tests carried out yesterday. 248,818 people have tested positive, and that's an increase of 2,412 cases since yesterday. 10,025 people are currently in hospital with the coronavirus. That's down 17% from the 11,716 this time last week. And sadly, of those who've tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, 35,341 have now died. And that's an increase of 545 fatalities since yesterday. And of course, our thoughts are with the families of all of those who've lost their lives to this virus. Before I turn to some of the work that DEFRA is doing to ensure that we are able to uh, harvest this year's farm harvest, I want to remind people of the details of the next phase of our fight against the coronavirus. Firstly, on slide one, as you can see, in order to monitor our progress, we are establishing a new COVID alert system with five levels, each relating to the level of threat posed by the virus. The alert level will be based primarily on the R value and the number of coronavirus cases. And in turn, that alert level will determine the level of social distancing measures in place. The lower the level, the fewer the measures. The higher the level, the stricter the measures. Throughout the period of lockdown, which started on March the 23rd, we were at level four. Thanks to the hard work and sacrifices of the British people in this lockdown, we have helped to bring the R level down, and we are now in a position to begin moving to level three in careful steps. Turning now to slide two, we have set out the first of three steps we will take to carefully modify the measures, gradually ease the lockdown, and begin to allow people to return to their way of life. But crucially, do this while avoiding what would be a second peak that overwhelms the NHS. After each step, we will closely monitor the impact of, the step, of that step on the R value and the number of infections and all the available data and we will only take the next step when we are satisfied that it is safe to do so. So in step one, as the Prime Minister announced last week, those who cannot work from home should now speak to their employer about going to work. And people can now spend time outdoors and exercise as often as they like. Finally, turning to slide three, having taken the first step in carefully adjusting some of the measures, and our advice to people on what to do. Our clear advice is to stay alert, control the virus, and save lives. And staying alert means staying at home as much as possible and working from home if this is possible. Limiting contact with other people and where contact is made with other people, keeping your distance. Uh, washing your hands regularly and also staying at home and self-isolating if you or a household member show symptoms of the virus. My final point today relates to the availability of labour this year for the farming harvest. Uh, every year, large numbers of people come from countries such as Romania and Bulgaria to take part in the harvest, harvesting crops such as strawberries and salads and vegetables. We estimate that probably only about a third of the people that would normally come are already here and small numbers may continue to travel. But one thing is clear, and that is that this year, we will need to rely on British workers to lend a hand to help bring that harvest home. Over the last couple of months, we have been working with industry on a plan to support and help people taking second jobs, particularly those who are furloughed. And we have launched a new Pick for Britain website uh, that enables people to go online check what job issues there are, what job availability there is, and to marry up job opportunities from growers and employers 
uh, with those people seeking uh, a second job, particularly those that are furloughed. And we believe that those who are furloughed may be getting to the point that uh, uh, they want to lend a hand and play their part. Uh, they may be wanting to get out and they may be wanting to supplement their income with an additional job. And if, those, uh, if they do feel that way, I would urge them uh, to visit that website and to look at the opportunities that are there. Uh, I will now turn to Angela McLean, who will give you further updates on the coronavirus. Thank you. If I could have the next slide, please. This slide shows the way people are moving around using their own, uh, their own cars, light goods vehicles or heavy goods vehicles, or in public transport in the three graphs on the bottom. Uh, the data runs from the 16th of March to the 17th of May. And what we see is that although there is some increase in the use of private cars and also in light goods vehicles and heavy goods vehicles, that the reduction in the use of, uh, of public transport, whether that be national rail, uh, tube and buses in London or buses elsewhere, fell very low uh, and has stayed very low. Uh, that is very good news for all of us because it means that people are continuing to respect the fact that if we can, we must stay at home in order to prevent the transmission of this virus. Next slide, please. So this next slide, in the top there, in red, shows the number of tests being done each day. And what you see is that um, it's been very much higher, really, for the second half of, of, of that graph. So the graph runs from the 6th of April to the 19th of May. Uh, on the 19th of May, there were 89,784 tests. And what that translates into uh, is daily confirmed tests, so, ha sorry, daily confirmed cases. So each day, um, how many people across all sorts of different settings uh, had a, 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 po a positive test? It's quite difficult to interpret that green graph uh, because it's in the context of lots of different people being allowed to be tested uh, and indeed, of course, uh, lots, lots and lots of extra testing become av becoming available. And when I want to know what's happening uh, every day with coronavirus infections, if I could have the next slide, please, I turn to data from hospitals and the estimates of the number of new daily admissions into hospitals each day. So uh, we have this time series best for England, uh, so I, 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 we, we tend to look at the English data. And what you see there, so that's really the flow of infected people into hospitals, and it's therefore a much more sensitive way um, of keeping track of what's happening uh, across the country. So what you see is a, a, a graph that rose sharply uh, from uh, at the beginning of March, it had already risen before then, and peaked on April the 2nd. And that's actually exactly the date that we would have expected it to peak, given the lockdown uh, that we all uh, took on board uh, on the 23rd of March, and the fact that it would take about 10 days uh, for that sudden drop in the number of new infections to turn into the sudden drop that you see there in the number of people arriving in hospital with COVID. And then what you see is that that has fallen um, fairly steadily since then, um, it's not falling quite as fast as it was right at the very beginning, uh, and, and that is a cause of, for debate about why is that. And a different way of keeping track of um, how, much, uh, how much infection is there in hospital is to look at the numbers, get, numbers of people who are really ill. So uh, the bottom graph there uh, is to do with people who need mechanical ventilation. So those are the people who, who are really most ill. And what it shows is, of all the, the facilities that we have, so of all the beds in hospital where there is a mechanical ventilator, how many of them are being used by a patient who is infected with COVID? And what you see is that that peaks, not surprisingly, a little bit later than the, the peak in new admissions, because, of course, this is now a much longer... You, you can only appear once uh, in, in, in... You can only be a new admission once, but, of course, you can be in a hospital bed uh, for lots and lots of days... And so you see that uh, with, with a later peak, a flatter peak, and a slower decline, but nevertheless a sustained decline across all four of our nations. Next slide, please. This breaks out uh, the number of people in hospital with COVID-19 right across the UK. So we have it for the four nations of England, Northern Ireland, 
Wales and Scotland, but England is then uh, broken up into different regions. If we look at, uh, and you can see that there is a, a fair bit of variability uh, across the uh, different nations and the different regions. What you see is that some, for some regions, the number of people in hospital is, has fallen rapidly and is still falling quite rapidly. And for others, the number of people in hospital, whilst it's still falling, uh, is not falling as fast as in other places. Next slide, please. Here we see people who have sadly died from COVID with a confirmed positive test here across the UK. This is a graph that we're familiar with, and we know that the numbers are always very low on Saturdays and Sundays. And for that reason, because this is a very pronounced weekly pattern uh, in the cases, we, we look instead of at the, the raw numbers, the blue bars, we look at the gold line, and that's a seven-day rolling average. So we use that on purpose because we want to average out the effect of the, uh, the, the, the weekend effect. And what you see with that, um, with that rolling average is that there is a, a, a steady decline in the number of confirmed COVID deaths here. Next slide, please. There are several different ways of counting how many people have died because of this pandemic here in the UK. And here are a couple of different ones. So the first, the top graph there runs from the 14th of March to the 19th of May, and what it compares is ONS data on weekly deaths with COVID-19 confirmed or suspected, so that's the higher purple line, or uh, weekly deaths with COVID confirmed with a positive test. So you can imagine that not everybody who is suspected of dying with COVID uh, has actually had a, a positive test. That's why the blue line lies underneath the purple line. And then the graph, the bar graph below it, uh, breaks those deaths out into deaths that occurred in hospital, deaths that occurred in care homes, at home, or in other places. And what we see is that every one of those different coloured bars is now falling. Deaths in hospital is falling, deaths in care homes is also falling, and as are deaths at home and other deaths. So whilst we remain very sad uh, that, and, and really our hearts go out to the families of all those people, we do look at these falling deaths uh, with uh, some sense of relief uh, that these numbers are consistently falling across sectors now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Angela. Um, turning now to um, the first of our questions from the uh, public, I think we have a, a video question from uh, Coljeet. Hi, I'd like to understand what the UK government are doing in terms of gathering data and information from other countries across the world and Europe that have uh, eased lockdown restrictions in terms of taking lessons learned from their approach and uh, uh, using those on our own journey to easing the restrictions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Colgy. I think that is a, a very important question. We've known from the beginning uh, of this epidemic that we've been roughly two to three weeks behind uh, Italy and France. Uh, we've seen uh, the trajectory of the epidemic in those countries, uh, seen how they responded. Many of the approaches that uh, we've taken have obviously been very similar to those uh, countries. And of course, in, in many other areas that we are considering now, including uh, potentially having uh, quarantine uh, at the border for arrivals, we're also seeking to learn lessons from the approach taken from some of those other countries. Uh, I may ask whether Angela has any particular points she wants to, to add from an epidemiological point of view. I think that those points are very good and that uh, uh, it's, it's obviously really, really important and a very good point that we need to look to our near neighbours and also countries further away uh, to learn what works and how long it takes uh, to see if something is working or not working. Uh, the two I would uh, draw particular uh, lessons from would be South Korea, where I feel they've made inspiring use of uh, all kinds of different contact tracing in order to control infection, to an extent that they are now down to handfuls of new cases every day. And when they say new cases, they mean people they've found in the community uh, because of their contact tracing efforts. And I think that is uh, an, an experience that we 
are aiming to emulate. The other country I would look to is Germany, where uh, the importance of testing uh, has, has always been so clear, and from, uh, that is a place from where we have learned uh, that we need to grow our testing facility and have grown our testing facility. Thank you, Paul Jip. Thank you very much. And the uh, next question uh, we have, uh, I think, is a written one, which is uh, from Nick uh, from Gatwick. Uh, and his question is, for those of us that work in sectors uh, of which we cannot return to work, aviation, hospitality, etc., will we see the government increasing the length of payment holidays for both mortgages and loans to ensure we can financially weather this storm too? And Nick, I think the point that I would make on this is that uh, Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, has uh, announced an unprecedented and very comprehensive package to support both businesses during this time of crisis, but also employees that are affected. So businesses are able to access the uh, coronavirus business interruption loan, uh, and there have also been a number of other grants to help small businesses, and business rates have been set aside. And in the case of employees in those businesses, we've obviously had the furlough scheme, the job retention scheme. Uh, it's now the case that around 8 million people are furloughed under that scheme. And I know that the Chancellor is thinking very carefully about how that can evolve as we go through these various stages, because it is the case, as you point out in your question, that there will be sectors uh, in areas such as hospitality, uh, or in the restaurant trade or in aviation and others um, where it's very difficult for business to get back to anything close to normal for some time. And I know that the Treasurer will be thinking very carefully about how the job retention scheme that we have can evolve uh, to help support those businesses as they tentatively try to return to business uh, in July. I will um, move on now to some of the questions from uh, the journalists, starting with Sophie Hutchinson from the BBC. Good afternoon. You were just saying how inspired you are by South Korea and Germany, the contact tracing and testing that's been going on there. Do you regret the decision that the government made in March to abandon that sort of tracing in the community? Well, I think um, the point that I would make on the uh, testing and uh, tracing is we've been expanding, ramping up that testing capacity. Uh, over the last couple of months, uh, we got it to 100,000 capacity by the end of April. We're continuing to build that. This week, Matt Hancock has made clear that anybody over the age of five with symptoms can get a test. And it's also the case that we've now recruited over 20,000 people to assist with uh, contract, uh, contact tracing so that we can uh, help to track down uh, infections and hotspots for this virus as we try to emerge uh, from lockdown. I think it's the case that uh, you know, early on uh, in this epidemic, uh, clearly there was a, uh, a priority to make sure that people showing symptoms who worked in the NHS because of their close proximity uh, with patients uh, had those tests, so there was priority given uh, to those. Uh, but we are now in the position where we're able to offer uh, um, um, testing to anybody over the age of five with symptoms, and that's going to be quite crucial uh, to developing our track and trace capabilities in the months ahead. Angela, sir. I, I think I would agree that at the time, with the testing we had, the right thing to do was to focus it on people who were really sick in hospital, so we knew who in hospital had COVID. So it was the right thing to do at the time. Sophie, is there anything else you'd like to... Yes, just to ask, so you would agree, therefore, that your strategy has been based on capacity rather than the science? Well, it's, the, it's undoubtedly the case that early on um, we were uh, wanting to build that capacity. And we pointed out before, there were countries like Germany that naturally had more uh, capacity existing in their uh, economy. Uh, we were building it very rapidly uh, from, a very, uh, from a very early stage. And we have now got to the point, uh, as, as Matt Hancock pointed out this week, that we can offer tests to anybody over the age of five with symptoms. And that's going to be pretty critical uh, in terms of developing that track and trace capability. Um, next, we have John Ray from ITV. Hi there, good afternoon. A question to each of you, uh, uh, please, uh, about the return to uh, school. Um, I wonder if uh, you'll both accept the deep, uh, profound and very sincere fears 
of teachers and parents about heading back to school beginning at the uh, beginning in June. And for you, Minister, um, this question, when so much has quite obviously gone wrong with the government's leadership of this crisis, track and tracing, PPE, care homes, uh, you can't really blame teachers for not believing you when it comes to returning to school. Uh, and for the scientists, please, um, frankly, isn't it just too early to conclude that the science says that it's safe to return to schools? Well, John, it won't surprise you to know that I, uh, I don't uh, share your caricature of the government's approach in this. Uh, of course, there have been challenges along the way uh, in these extraordinary times we're in on a number of fronts. Other countries have uh, experienced similar challenges. Uh, the government has uh, grappled with what's been a very difficult uh, situation and made timely decisions and taken action uh, to ensure that we uh, had the capacity we needed to deal uh, with this epidemic. And so, for instance, we constructed very quickly all of those Nightingale hospitals that gave us that additional capacity, should that have been needed, and the steps we took meant that we were able to flatten the curve uh, of this virus uh, better than some had expected us to be able to. But on the specific issue of schools, we're working very closely with the teaching unions and with school leaders uh, on our approach to this. Uh, we do believe that it's important that uh, initially we get the uh, year ones and uh, year sixes back into a school environment to help prepare them uh, for the move up to um, uh, secondary school in the case of the latter, but also to help settle in uh, the younger children uh, in the former. Um, and we do believe that other countries like Denmark have demonstrated how it's possible, in fact, uh, to bring schools back um, into uh, opening, uh, albeit in a socially distanced way, albeit with uh, fewer pupils initially and um, staggering uh, the, the, the times that year groups arrive and so on. So other, uh, other countries have demonstrated ways that this can be done. Uh, and linking to the question that uh, uh, was raised by Coljeet at the beginning of this uh, uh, question session, I think it is important that we learn from those other countries, and that's exactly uh, what we're trying to do. My final point is we should bear in mind that throughout all of this crisis, I completely understand that there is apprehension uh, and anxiety of those who are being asked to return to work. But there are some sectors, uh, like the NHS, like police, uh, like the food sector, uh, who have continued to work. And in the case of uh, the food industry, have continued to work and done so successfully by putting in place social distancing measures. So we don't underestimate that there are challenges and that there's a job to do to reassure people. Uh, but we do believe it's uh, right uh, to, to embark on this as other countries have. Angela, do you want to add anything? Yes, thank you, John. Our scientists have been very clear in our advice that changes to lockdown as we modelled them need a highly effective track, trace and isolate system to be in place. And we're also very clear that any change to social distancing measures should be based upon observed levels of, uh, of, of incidence uh, in places that those are going to be changed, not on a fixed state. Okay. John, is there anything else you wanted to... Just to pick up to e each of you, to the scientists, as I understand it, the track and trace will not be in place, fully in place, by the 1st of June. So does that affect the scientific advice you're, you're giving? Will it be safe to reopen schools? And, and to you, Minister, you seem to be accepting that the decision to send children back to school is not a scientific one, but a political calculation, uh, you know, even if that means that there is an aspect of risk uh, for uh, the children. So we're getting a full update on Thursday of exactly what's going to be in place and when. Uh, so perhaps you, you seem to be party to knowledge that I'm not party to. Um, so... Uh, well, I'm going to wait and to see what I get told on Thursday about what's going to be in place by when. And, and John, look, it's, um, uh, it's absolutely the case that as we evolve our policy uh, from, from lockdown to uh, something more nuanced with easements uh, being progressively rolled out in several stages over the course of this summer, uh, of course, absolutely, we are following the science on this. Uh, and just as other countries like Denmark uh, who've also embarked on a similar journey, are also following the science. So I don't accept that it's putting the science to one side, but it is uh, absolutely the case 
but all of us are going to have to live alongside this virus for some time to come. And we do need to try to live our lives and identify ways of um, returning uh, to work as far as possible and to put in place those social distancing measures. And that's what's happening. Uh, it's what's happened from day one in supermarkets, as people will have seen. It's what's happened in uh, day one in the NHS, who've obviously been dealing with people uh, affected by the virus. Uh, and uh, it's the case that as other uh, walks of life get back to something closer to normality, uh, we do have to um, identify ways of doing that while observing the social distancing. Um, the next question is Andy Bell from Channel 5. Thank you very much. Um, today, the Chief Executive of Care England has told the Parliamentary Committee that people were discharged from hospital back into care homes when they were either symptomatic or simply didn't have any COVID-19 status, they hadn't been tested. Um, I mean, Secretary of State, how was that allowed to happen as a policy? And uh, Dame Angela, was there any scientific advice given at the time about doing that? Well, look, uh, we don't accept the, the caricature that, uh, that we took an approach that was wrong. Very early on um, in this epidemic, uh, we had protocols in place for care homes. There was guidance as to how they should approach things. As the situation developed, then uh, more stringent policies were introduced uh, by way uh, of uh, policy around discharge. Uh, and um, we got to the point that everybody was tested before discharge. But in those, um, uh, those early weeks, there will have been some instances where people may have been discharged who were asymptomatic. And there, um, there may have been some uh, small number of instances where they may have been showing symptoms but would have been isolated. And that was the guidance at the uh, time uh, that was in place. Uh, but we have um, strengthened that um, very much ever since then. Uh, we now have testing and a much, uh, a very rigorous discharge policy that's uh, in place, and that is uh, getting uh, stronger all the time. And it is reassuring, while it's obviously a tragedy uh, to see the number of deaths that we've had through this epidemic, it is reassuring, as Angela said earlier, that uh, uh, we've passed the peak epidemic that was taking place in care homes and the number of deaths and number of uh, infections is now declining. Angela, would you like to add? I can't answer that question without going back to the exact list of what advice was given when, and I don't want to give you an answer that's not correct. So if you'll forgive me, I'll, I'll, could we take notice of that question? Is that okay? We can get back to you. Well... Yes, obviously, if you can get back, that would be very good. I mean, it leads on to another question I have, which is that uh, the, the, the chair of the Science and uh, Technology Committee today has said that the advice given by scientists is too secretive in this whole process, that more should be published. I mean, do both of you think that would be a good idea? Do you think that would lead to better decision making? Well, I don't uh, really accept, Andy, that, um, that it is secretive. We have been having these briefings on a daily basis for weeks and weeks now and um, this is my fourth time doing uh, this, this daily press conference and uh, at every one of those occasions I've either had uh, somebody from the uh, Chief Scientific Advisors Department or from Public Health England or the NHS alongside me and I think we've been very candid in sharing with people at every step of the way uh, exactly what we are doing and why we are doing it and what the evidence shows, complete with graphs that show the trajectory and the trends uh, and the epidemiology behind uh, this outbreak. So I, I don't really uh, accept that uh, criticism at all. I think we've been uh, very candid throughout this in terms of sharing knowledge with people and sharing our approach with people. I can tell... I... Okay. Uh, we, we have been really very, very focused on trying to give really high-quality advice completely rooted in evidence. I, I, I can assure you that at every conversation, we are always challenging each other to say, what is the evidence for that? Uh, you know, our job is to give science advice here and make sure everything we, see is, we, we say is, is rooted in good quality science. I, I have to admit that um, I haven't spent much time worrying about how secretive or not secretive it is. I can see that is going to be a, a, a big issue when we have a big look back. I'd be more inclined to, to address that then. I realise that's, that, that's not what you want me to say, I know, but uh, I, don't see any, I don't think that's the most interesting conversation. I would say I said the most interesting conversation is are we able to give good advice? Thank you very much. Um, next we have Jane Merrick from The Eye. Thank you. Um, I want to follow up on Sophie's question, first of all to Dame Angela. 
In February, a WHO China report said that community testing and contact tracing was the best way to tackle coronavirus. So was the decision then on the 12th of March to scale back on community testing and contact tracing in the UK, was that based on sound scientific advice? And to the Secretary of State, who takes ultimate responsibility for these decisions and for that decision on the 12th of March? Is it the ministers or the scientists offering the advice? The advice that we gave was certainly took account of what testing was available. It was what was the best thing to do with the test that we had. We could not have people in hospital with COVID symptoms not knowing whether or not they had COVID. And as I explained earlier, uh, Jane, we have been expanding dramatically our testing capacity over, the, uh, over recent weeks and months, simply because it is going to be a very important feature of that uh, track and trace approach that we're developing. And we've recruited now over 20 tracers to uh, work on that. And as we evolve this policy and emerge from full lockdown to uh, something where we try to support people getting back to work normally, having that track and trace approach uh, is going to be um, increasingly important and that's why we are uh, increasing that capacity. As I pointed out earlier, at the beginning of this, uh, when there was an issue of capacity on tests, then of course you needed to uh, prioritise where those tests were most needed. Uh, and that was uh, in our NHS. You couldn't have a situation where uh, people working in the NHS did not know whether they uh, had the coronavirus or not. So it was right to initially prioritise the tests uh, for uh, that uh, particular outcome. If, that... if I could follow up, um, just to, to go back to Dame Angela then, I mean, your colleague... Sir Patrick Vallance told the Science Committee on the 25th of March that he wished that there, had, there was more capacity available. So are you saying then that even given the sort of the international um, expertise on coronavirus, it was just what was available at the time, the capacity that was available at the time, that was the best advice that you could give in the context of that capacity? I think that's what I just said, yes. Yeah. Okay. Right, thank you very much, um, Jane. And um, next we have uh, Stefan from City AM. Thank you, Secretary of State. David Frost and the UK Brexit negotiating team have said on multiple occasions that one of the key contentions, contentious areas sorry, of uh, negotiations has been fishing policy and that if there isn't any movement on these talks by June, that the deal will be unlikely to go through. This would mean that the City of London is locked out of lucrative EU markets. With this in mind, can you tell me what the government is prioritising higher? The City of London and financial services firms, which contribute 7% of GDP to the economy, or the fishing industry, which contributes 0.1%. And to Dame Angela, is there any chance of the lockdown being lifted entirely in remote islands or, uh, or isolated communities in the UK who haven't had any um, recorded cases of COVID-19? Thank you very much, um, Stefan. The, the short answer is that we, in this negotiation, are prioritising becoming uh, an independent, self-governing country again. Uh, we want to make our own decisions, make our own laws, uh, control our own waters, yes, um, set our own fishing policy, have a seat at the table where fishing opportunities are negotiated uh, uh, each year, not only with our EU members, but also uh, with, uh, with countries such as Norway uh, and the Faroes. And we believe that the interests of our economy are best served uh, by us uh, taking back control and making our own laws again, and that is the approach we're taking. And so, as uh, David Frost has pointed out, there are a couple of... Uh, sticking points so far in these negotiations. One is that the uh, European Union uh, seem to be insisting that we continue to abide by their laws even after we've left. And the second is that the European Union seem to be saying that uniquely among every other country in the world, uh, the UK should um, give unlimited access to its waters uh, for EU countries, even though we're not any longer part of the common fisheries policy. And both of those, as a point of principle, are wrong, uh, and that is why we've uh, adopted the stance that we have. Well, as you know, you can't ask me what policy might be, but you can ask me what kind of question a scientist is looking at, and I can tell you for sure, location is a huge focus of ours at the moment. Uh, of course, I mean, our island, islands are a very special case, 
uh, which is, of course, particularly interesting. Uh, but there are also other parts of the country that, that have, uh, you know, the spread of infection across the country is really quite uh, diverse, quite heterogeneous. And that does, of course, raise interesting questions, particularly as we get incidents right, right down about what should we do about that. Stefan, did you want, you want to come back again? Thank you. Thank you. Just want to come back to you, Secretary of State. I do understand the rationale for the fishing policy and the negotiations that are going by, but can you say today uh, definitively if they will not be softened for the sake of financial services firms, which contribute so much to the UK economy, uh, getting access to EU markets, which is so important for them? Well, look, I, I just think in this uh, approach, it's very important that you're clear about uh, your priorities and um, uh, one of ours is to become an independent coastal state in control of our own waters again and managing and controlling uh, access uh, to our waters. Uh, that's been uh, our position from the very beginning uh, and it will not change. And I think it's um, not something to get into to be saying you have to sacrifice one industry in order to give a leg up to another. That's not the way to approach this negotiation. The way to approach it is to uh, stand up for our interests as an independent country, and that's the approach that we uh, are taking. Now, next we have um, Ben Fishwick from Portsmouth News. Uh, thank you, Secretary of State. Um, e even with uh, extra government funding, councils are struggling to cover their increased costs during this crisis. Uh, can you commit to matching pound for pound their expenditure and cover any budget shortfalls caused by a loss of income? And then separately on testing, we, we have a testing centre in Portsmouth, but several of our readers have, who were tested on the 1st of May waited for two weeks for a result, despite being told it would be arriving in 48 to 72 hours later, 14 days after their test. Several of them were told their results were unclear. Is there the capability to ensure a proper turnaround of testing? Um, well, Ben, on your uh, latter point, we... Um... We do, we do recognise that there, there have been uh, a few uh, reports of people not getting the results to their tests uh, as quickly as they would expect. And it's also the case that there are instances where a test result comes back as inconclusive and sometimes second tests have to take place. And I might ask Angela in a moment to say a bit more uh, on that. On your former point about local authorities, of course the government recognises that this coronavirus outbreak has put pressure uh, on local authorities. We've recognised that and we've uh, given them an additional £3.2 billion to, to uh, help them cope with the uh, new burdens that, uh, that have been in place. We've also uh, made available £600 million to support care homes and, uh, and help them respond uh, to this crisis. So, yes, we recognise that there are uh, new burdens on local authorities as a result of this. And, um, and we've, we've put in place some additional funding to recognise that. And I completely appreciate that local authorities will always uh, say that they need uh, further funding. Uh, and, um, you know, in situations like this, they will have uh, funds set aside for uh, events of this sort. And we think that the, uh, the approach that we've taken with that £3.2 billion uh, injection is the, uh, the appropriate intervention from government to support them in the, the really important work that they're doing. Um, Angela, did you want to add anything on the... I think really running a, a rapid and reliable testing system is an entirely operational issue. And so the science advice would be you need to have a rapid and reliable testing system. OK. Ben, is there any final thing you wanted to... Uh, are, you, are you confident we do have a rapid and reliable testing system? I think, it's, I think it's getting better. And we, one of the things we've actually looked at a lot today uh, is, is um, evidence from other countries. And it clearly is possible to set up testing systems with a 48-hour turnaround. OK, thank you very much, uh, Ben. And, um, uh, and thank you to, to everyone for those questions. I think we've covered uh, a, a large amount of ground today. But thank you very much.